our recording. And so let us begin, start the slideshow from the first slide. Yes, okay, brilliant. So what is a profit? Please ignore the date, March 14, 2012. That's when I actually uh, made this presentation. But please, please, please ignore it. Please also ignore the Old Testament major profit part. Ignore it. We're in minor profits, so don't get freaked out, okay? But it is the same thing. It is the same thing. But why don't we do a little, uh, why don't we do a little, <coughs> excuse me, why don't we do a little interaction, okay? And let's actually get into the biblical witness, all right? And the biblical witness, go into Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 through 22. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 22, okay? NIV. NIV. What? Yeah, we agreed to NIV. All right, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 22, okay? Who wants to read 9 through uh, 13 for me? Go for it, Cynthia. We don't have any NIV. Uh, what translation do you have? That's okay. That's okay. But Yeah, but next time bring NIV. Okay? All right. 9 through 13. Go for it. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nation's land. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Amen. Okay, so first and foremost, in this text, at this portion right now, what is considered a detestable thing? What is considered a detestable thing? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Okay, very good. What else is considered a detestable thing? He goes on a list. Moses goes on a list here. What are other things that are detestable? And raise your hand, please. Yeah. Burnett. Uh, casting spells. Casting spells. Being Harry Potter. Being <laughs> Wizard. <laughs> Cynthia. Child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. Very good. What else? What else? There's like six or seven, but give me two more so I can have a full full hand. What else is a detestable thing? <coughs> yeah, Cynthia. Being a medium. Very good. And what is a medium? A medium is a person who consults either natural spirits or the dead. Okay? Natural. Natural spirits, meaning like the spirit of the air or the spirit of the rock or the spirit of the tree. He's either a, a person that communicates with the natural spirits or with the dead. Okay? One more. Give me one more. Ace. Ace. Interprets omens. Now, this is interesting. This is what an omen was. You cut up a cat or you cut up an animal and you read its guts. A cat, animal, some, some sacred kind of animal. Most times or not, it was a goat. Most times or not, it was a cow and so forth. But <clears throat> reading omens, what that means is you cut up it, you, you pour the guts on a table, and you read it. You read it. And apparently the guts of these animals will tell you, like, the future or will tell you if it's going to be a good season, if it's going to be a good season to grow corn, a good season to grow this. It would be a good season to produce children. That's what reading omens are. Okay? So, excellent. Okay. What is the purpose of these detestable, detestable practices, you think? Now, keep in mind. It doesn't say it blatantly. It doesn't say it blatantly. So we have to we have to answer this question based on the text. But Cynthia, what do you think the purpose of these practices were? Isn't it to um, explain the unknown? Very good. Exactly. It was to explain the unknown, or it was also to uh, showcase the unforeseen. Okay. So for example, if you were a king. If you were a king and you believe that the person that should continue on the kingship or the kingdom is your son, 
you really need to put a lot of stake in having a son. Can you do that 2,000 years ago? Can you control the gender of your child 2,000 years ago? Exactly. Exactly. Something unforeseen or something unknown. So what they would do is these foreign nations or these neighboring nations, they would cast their bets. They would cast their bets to see if they could manipulate the spirits or the gods or dead people to see, hey, if you could help us out here, we'll take care of this for you. You know what I'm saying? If you could give me a son, if the king would say, if you could give me a son, I will sacrifice this many things to you, right? Or if you could give us a crop, because we're in a famine right now, I will sacrifice my virgin daughter to you, okay? So it was the whole idea, the whole idea for these detestable practices is to know the unforeseen, to know the unknown, but it's also to manipulate the supernatural to get what you want, okay? One more time. I don't have this in my notes, but you should know it. The reasons why they did these detestable practices is to know the unknown, to see the unforeseen, and to manipulate the super, supernatural to get what they want. Manipulate who? The supernatural to get what they want. Absolutely. Number three things, three things. The purpose of these detestable practices is to know the unknown, to see the unforeseen, and to manipulate the supernatural to get what they want. Exactly. Cynthia and then Sela. So, um, just like you were saying, like, we can't, like, we know now, like, the man is responsible for Right, 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 right. But you know what I'm saying? Based on the chromosomes, body, right, know, like, right. Blah, blah, blah. So, anyways, that being said, like we know that it's not based off of right. casting lots. Or right, whatever. right. So, how, like, like I don't know. I guess in my question, it's just like obviously, to some degree, it must have been effective you know, for them to believe it, right? Sure, because coincidence is powerful. So whenever you have a situation where a king wanted a son, and coincidentally he had a son, it further emphasized the fact that, oh, our, our gods are real, or our religion's real. But wasn't it too that if, if you were found to be a false, whatever you were, like, killed or something? That's in Israel society. Israel society. So uh, well, let's get into that right now. So instead of these detestable practices, but before we do, Sela, go ahead. Uh, for the, the last one, to manipulate the supernatural. Yeah. So the prophets were able to manipulate, change things. Not Israel society. It's the neighboring countries of Israel. Oh, so just these were the four mediums in general. Exactly, mediums in general. They they won't say it, but in essence, their practice is to manipulate their gods. For something, so they were. Like, they were. It could be proven that they were able to like change. Sure, they were. They basically they were trying to make deals with the gods. Okay. Yeah. So okay, let's continue on. Fourteen through twenty-two. This is the doozy. You read the. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, just because, like, I mean, I I know I've heard like like with the Aztecs they would or other like people, yeah. Right. Um, say that the eclipse is like an act of God. Right. And we have to do blah, blah, blah. But right. we know that that's not the case. So it's, a, it's all based on. Well, I know that there are some things that can be explained away. Right. That were old, like, practices. Sure. Practices. Sure. But do you think, like, some of those things are, like, really have, like, power to them? They could. I mean, I mean, when you dabble, when, as Christians, what do we call it now? Demonic? Yeah. Right. So you can. Yeah, you can dabble in that ignorantly or not, and you're like playing with things that you don't have control over, assuming that you have control over it. You know, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. That's absolutely dangerous. And there could be a lot of demonic going on there. Absolutely. So, all right. Uh, Ebony, 14 through 22 for me. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the nation dispossess. dispossess. Okay. Listen to those who practice surgery. 
But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you ask of the Lord. Lord your God, at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what, what they say is what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the, their brothers. I will keep, I mean, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I commanded him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my, in my name, I myself will call him to, to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when sorry, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? <clears throat> if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. All right, excellent. So instead of the detestable practices of the foreign nations, who did the Lord provide for Israel? What is the word? A prophet. Okay. And so why a prophet? Because it was a request by the people of Israel so that they weren't able to, so that they chose not to hear the pure voice of the Lord. Okay. There was a moment, I guess, during Israel's wilderness, uh, journey where they actually heard the voice of the Lord and they told Moses to tell God stop we don't want to hear it anymore it freaks us out we we need someone else or we need a mediator and that is the prophet the prophet is the mouthpiece of God the prophet is the mouthpiece of God okay how is he described in this text how is the prophet described here um, <clears throat> the half or like anywhere, anywhere. Well, what something that you noticed that no, caught caught your eye? Is that <coughs> a prophet could, if a prophet would speak um, a word mm -hmm. in the name of God, but it's from other guys, he would be put to death. Very like, good. If um, if he if it doesn't even come to pass, it kind of covers. I don't know. Good, go, go, go. Good. I thought like yeah. if they prophesy something and it doesn't come to pass, God is kind of like. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. That wasn't, that wasn't me. me. Right. Kind of right. Like right. Shaggy song, but I feel like he. It's almost like a. I don't know why that was what I thought. Like, if oh, if it's wrong and it it wasn't from God, but yeah. like, what if? Are there any exceptions to that? Like that there is a word from God, but people ruined it. Um, that's the difficulty with prophecy. That is the difficulty with prophecy because here's the reason why. Um, if God gave you a word. You're going to interpret it. You know what I'm saying? We need to understand that. When God gives people words, you immediately interpret it. It's like playing telephone. It's like playing telephone. He tells you a message. You are going to change it up because of something. You know what I'm saying? Why? Human beings interpret everything. That's our nature. That is our nature. Okay? So for the prophet, this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal. Why? Because you have to be very careful in knowing, is this from the Lord or is this from me or did I pollute? <laughs> you know, am I interjecting what? You know, this causes a lot of discernment and so forth for the prophet. Yes, Cynthia. Um, for like the Israelites, they were Yeah. Some people, well, apparently here, it depends on the person. Some people will do it fake, like Miss Cleo. I don't know if you guys know her, but Ms. back in the, yeah, <laughs> back in the 90s, like, they found out that she was totally fake. But maybe, just maybe, it is true. It is true. Now, a lot of the time for me, because I'm skeptical of those things, um, I find the majority of the time fake. But then when there's certain moments when it's like, wait a minute, how did you know that without knowing me? 
you know there are those moments there are those moments um could god use that maybe but also again it could be something demonic. not it could be something demonic right because the question is how are you going to use that knowledge now that's the question yeah i was watching this one show out of uh, boredom uh <coughs> island medium okay uh, and um yeah she's a, a devout catholic or christian okay but she professes that she is a, a medium okay and um like I've, i i remember the first episode i watched i was like this chick is like straight up right. in tune with spiritual things and i was wondering if it's if it is, because we all have this perception that mediums and psychics and palm readers, they're demonic. Because right, right. They hear from spirits aside from, right. from the Holy Spirit and his angels or whatever. I don't know how to, uh -huh. anyway. But um, but it's like, how could she say that she's like, she believes in God and like, what's wrong with her? Like, How can, how can, how can a person say he believes in God and still kill six million Jews? You know what I'm saying? So it's, 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 it's because people, people could say that I believe in God. People you can say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There's more than just the words. There needs to be also your actions to back it up. Okay. But isn't that weird that she could say that she believes in God and then have these spiritual gifts? Wouldn't somebody Possibly. say maybe those gifts are from God? She says that one, one could say, God. one could definitely say that. But again, what's the purpose for these knowledge what's the purpose of for these nuggets of truth and is then is that really now don't get me wrong she could be abusing the gift because we could abuse the gift a lot of christians abuse their gifts um but uh also people can be devout but they're limited in their knowledge of who god is and then there might be a moment where she comes up and says hey i was wrong this is not it you know um, did God use me in certain ways here and there? Yes, praise the Lord, but I know it's better, and I need to repent from my ways and so forth. So, yeah. Would you say, like, the kind of final test for whether something is of God, like, not questioning the, the legitimacy of yeah. something, but the final test of whether it's of God or not would be that it points back to him? Um, possibly, now, I don't know if it's the ultimate final test, but possibly that, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny that. I wouldn't deny that. But, um, according to the text, if it comes to pass, apparently it's from the Lord. But keep in mind, contextually, it is only within the realm of Israel society that this occurs. It's something different now, in my opinion, um, today. Uh, and we just need to discuss more about it, just like what we're doing right now, you know. But uh, so, yeah. Okay? So, may I continue on? So, that's what a prophet is. The prophet comes from God. It is a unique a unique position within Israel society. It is a unique position within the society of the people of God. Let's talk about now the actual word prophet, okay? There are three Hebrew words for the word prophet, okay? The uh, first one is chose, <coughs> chose, okay? Yeah, no, I was, though, just to do it. The first one is chose. Jose, okay? Now, I don't know what Jose means. Um, I used to, but uh, yeah. The second one is Roe. Roe. Jose? Jose. Jose. Roe. And then the third one, it doesn't, it doesn't rhyme, but it's Navi. Navi. Okay? So... <laughs> the three words in the Hebrew text used to be translated as prophet is Jose, Roe, and Navi. Navi is the most common word for prophet. It actually occurs over 300 times in the Old Testament. Okay? Navi. Navi. Um... Now, Akkadian influences of the word suggest it to mean to be called, to be called, okay? Uh, 
That's what that's where we get the word profit, Navi. Okay. So if I asked you on a test, what was the most common Hebrew word used for profit? It is Navi. Navi. Excellent. Okay. May I continue on? Okay. No. Oh, I don't know what that says. Okay, or like, oh. Yeah, it kind of does. Well, I'm, not, I'm a little blind. A little. You're a little blind, but it's a big deal. No, it's no big deal. Oh, okay. Maybe I should, uh, now that you're driving my van. No, just, it's not a big deal, I said. <laughs> yeah, tell it to the dent on the back. Oh no. Black Anyways. Mode. <laughs> May I continue okay, on? I was oh, okay. I found out what, what does that mean. What is Jose? A seer. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. It's a seer, and then what's Rohe mean? Roy is a, uh, what you call it? The mouth? Breath? The prophetic. Prophetic? Yeah. A There's a special word. Um, all right, may I continue on? Yeah. It seems like we're all good. All right, in the Old Testament, there are two kinds of prophets. We're not going to deal with the first. They're known as the former or non-literary. Why are they called non-literary? There's no book attributed to them. There's books about them, but they didn't write any books. Okay? So they are the former or non-literary prophets. <coughs> These people are the prophets found in the books Joshua all the way to 2 Kings, excluding Ruth, okay? And like I said, most prophets do not have books to call their own. One, the closest one is First and Second Samuel, but honestly, uh, because traditionally, a lot of people believe that the prophet Samuel wrote those books, First and Second Samuel, but honestly, if you are telling of your death, how can you actually be writing your book? You could be just like Moses. Yeah, sure. Yeah. There you go. So, so here, most prophets do not have books to call their own. And they usually dealt with the government of Israel. They usually dealt with the kings. Okay? Um, two famous prophets, two famous former prophets are who? Elijah and Elisha. Elisha. No, Isaiah is going to be the second group. So the two famous former prophets are Elisha or Elijah. So it's Eliyahu, that's Elijah, or Elisha, that's Elisha. The two famous former prophets. Two famous former prophets are Eliyahu, Elijah, <laughs> or Elisha, which is Elisha. Okay? So that's the first group. We're not going to deal with the first group. We're dealing with the second. They are known as the latter prophets. They are also known as literary prophets. They are known as classical prophets. Okay? Why are they known as literary? They are ones who wrote books. They're important ones. No, not that important. Well, equally. They're equally important as the as the former. Nope. So the people that uh, are considered latter prophets are Isaiah, like. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the twelve minor. Okay. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the twelve minor. Okay. I hear that. And they dealt with the entire society of Israel. They dealt with the entire society of Israel. They condemned, um, they're the ones that condemned Israel, um, the rich, the leaders. They defended the poor. They dealt with everybody. Okay? Cool. Yes. How come Samuel is not up there? Samuel? He's not a literary prophet. He's a former prophet. He's a for Samuel, the prophet Samuel, is a former prophet, non-literary. 
Would Moses be considered a performer? Moses is the archetype. He is the <laughs> he is the model of what a prophet should be. So he's in a class of himself. Ooh, dang. Ooh, just like me. No, I'm kidding. Okay. May I continue? Uh, in a second. Okay. So uh, I'll just stay here at the moment, but I'll talk more. Um, in Israel society, there were two ways to hear from the Lord. There were two ways, and there was two groups of people to hear from the Lord. One was the Levitical priesthood. And the Levitical priesthood were the people who guarded God's word, the law. Okay, so there was the Levitical priesthood that uh, that uh, that would be the conduit that God used for to speak to His people. But then there was also the prophets, and they went side by side. Okay, so the two ways that you could hear from the Lord was from the Le Levites, the priests, as well as the prophets. Okay. The Levitical priesthood was a very strict club. You had to be a specific person to be part of the Levitical priesthood. Particularly, you had to be a guy. Okay? You needed to have an XY chromosome to be an actual priest. Okay? So here's my question, and may I continue on? Can I continue on? Does that mean that a prophet could only be a man? Could a woman be a prophet? Very good. Yes. Very good. Exactly. Wasn't there, there, are, there, were many pro, there were many prophetesses in the Old Testament. First prophetess was Miriam. I shouldn't say first because that's Micah 6.4. That's the king later. But Miriam was considered a prophet. This person in Micah. Yes. Um, how... If, because there's so little on the women in the Bible, mm -hmm. how do people make big books about these women who have like two verses in the Bible? Um, it's there's a there's a there's a particular study, and it's basically the emphasis of secondary characters, and, and what it is is even though these certain characters only have one or two verses. Um, they tr they tr they try to ex extrapolate as much as they can about that person, and I forgot what study that is, but it has to do with um, focusing on secondary characters because a lot of times those secondary characters are extremely important. For example, Uriah, only maybe two or three verses about the guy, but because of him, it was this whole Bathsheba incident. You know what I'm saying? So there's these m minor characters, both men and women, that a lot of times. The Bible, even though they only provide two, three verses about them, they emphasize so much. You know? Is there like other books or like records of these characters? Uh, I don't know, but possibly, possibly. A lot of the times it, it continues on in folk tradition, so okay. folk stories and so forth. Another particular pro is Deborah, Deborah. exactly, Deborah. It's Judges 4-4. Deborah was the ish. Deborah was awesome. She was she was she was like kind of like the Amazonian Wonder Woman. You know, she was the ish. She she knew what's up. Another prophet was I like this one. This one's my favorite. This one's my favorite because I love her name. Hulda. 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 Right? But hold, hold up. Russian, hold up. <coughs> hold up was actually the one that helped Josiah. Hold up was actually the one that helped Josiah start her, his revival. Hold up. started doing what? The revival of Josiah. Does anyone know who Josiah is? Yes, he's the king. He's the best king after David. Um, he reformed. He established the temple. He dedicated it. Hold up was the one that told Josiah to do those things. It was a woman prophet that started the revival. Okay? What? Yep, he helped Josiah with the revival. This is Hulda. Another one is Noah Daya. Noah Daya. I wonder what she was named after. <laughs> right. No, you're absolutely right. She, that's right. She named after Noah. Noah and Zedekiah. Um, Isaiah's wife was considered a prophet. Isaiah's wife was considered a prophet, okay? 
Yes. Sir? Excuse. Yes, Nabil. I got you, sir. Uh, we, we, we would like to comment at the last profit. When you will be writing the name of your, the list of your last, we will want to do a comment. So okay. please uh, give us a chance at that. Okay. Okay. One second. And then um, in the New Testament, there's also prophetesses. There's Anna, Luke 2, 36. Anna was a prophetess, prophetess or a prophet. We'll just keep that single nomenclature. And then also there was the daughters of Philip. They were prophets. They were prophets. Okay. So... Um, so there are women prophets in, uh, in the Old Testament. And what I wanted to convey is that there, um, there's, there's, when, when I said that there was two ways that God communicated to his people of Israel, there was the priesthood and there was the prophets. The priesthood is very orderly, very, think of it as kind of disciplined, or I shouldn't say disciplined, but think of them as very orderly. And order, this is the way it should go. We need to follow the rules, yada, 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 yada. But the prophet is a wild aspect of God. He is a wild aspect of God. He's the unexpected part, part of God. You know what I'm saying? Where it's just like, I can pick whoever I want to be my vessel. And God is allowed to be wild with the prophet. You know? So it's, it shows the two dynamic qualities of God. He's a very orderly God. But he's also a very wild guy. Okay? Uh, Nabil has a comment, but Cynthia, you had her hand up. Go ahead. So I was just going to say, I don't know. You know, like, there's there's a lot of suggestions that there was an actual prophet school. And so, um, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nabil, go ahead. What was your comment? Well. Uh, my comment was actually that I wanted to introduce uh, all of you uh, with with another prophet, that a uh, female prophet that is uh, living today. She is the part of our class. Class, you will be very happy to see her. She is Mina, and God has given her the gift of prophecy. Oh, amen. Hi, sir. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello, sir. Give me one second. Let me see if I can get you... Uh, you know what? I'm going to close this presentation. We're going to take a break. But before we take a break, we would like I'm going to see if I can get the video up, okay? There you are. Is that Mina? We can't see her. Oh, sorry. Hey, sorry. This is Mina, you guys. Hi. Everyone waving at you, Mina. Hi. Amen. So we'll continue on talking about prophecy. Um, let's take a 10-minute break, you guys, and then and then we'll we'll continue on from there, okay? Let's continue on. So uh, let's talk about the misconceptions of prophecy. Are you guys uh, there? sorry? Sorry for. It's quite all right. It's quite all right. I'm glad that you're up. I'm glad that I can see you guys. So what we're gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> lost connection actually at the time of it. Okay. All right, right on. At the end, I got to talk to SEO in Pakistan, so um, we'll, we'll take care of that, okay? But I'm glad that you guys are up right now. Um, can you see my screen with my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we can see. We can okay, see. so let's continue on. Misconceptions of profits. <coughs> Misconception one. <laughs> they are not fortune tellers. They are not fortune tellers. Oh, fortune tellers. They were fortune tellers. That is a misconception. They were fortune tellers. No, that is not true. They were not fortune tellers. They spoke of personal futures. That is another misconception. They did not, especially the literary. This literary did not speak of personal futures. They spoke about the future of the entire people of God. Okay? Another misconception, that they were psychics. No, they were not psychic. They did not read people's minds. They only listened to God, whatever he needed to say. Oh. <clears throat> 
They were not psychic. Is this um, correct for prophets today too? I would think that. Um, personal futures, we can talk about it, but uh, I think I think a, a proper a proper understanding of an Old Testament prophet, especially a literary classical latter prophet would be someone who addresses the entire community of God. Right. Okay. Uh, another misconception, they did horoscopes. No, they did not. They did not read the stars. They did not read the guts of animals. They did not get into that to get their communication from um, the divine. It was the divine that directly spoke to them. Okay. And also, another, a final misconception that they were hysterical babblers. They were not. They were not hysterical babblers. And the idea of a hysterical babbler is someone who gets possessed by something, you know. And, and for me, this is my personal opinion. You can take it as you like, but I don't think God possesses people. I don't think a, I don't think the Holy Spirit possesses people. Okay. Um, whenever you see in worship a moment where it seems like the person's body is beyond their control, a lot of times, and I'll just say it, it's demonic. Demonic spirits want to control you. Okay. However, if it is truly from the Lord, if it is truly from the Spirit, the way that I would say it is this is the human response to the overwhelming feeling of the Spirit. Okay? So if a person collapses, if a person uh, shakes, if a person is running, if a person is laughing hysterically, this is all the human response of feeling overwhelmed by the spirit. It can be. It, it can be. It can be. Yes, Evan. Um, so, I'm not going to say it, it is. But um, someone, a staff here, okay. she was saying that um, that um, the Holy Spirit, or God, um, like, showed her who was in control, and she, like, her whole body shook all up and down all okay. around the room. And yeah. And then she was saying, like, that's how I knew that God was in control because that wasn't my body and stuff. And she was, she was. So I personally, I personally, personally, personally would disagree with that. Um, I would say it in a different way. I would say that this person encountered the Spirit, realized that it was the Holy Spirit, and this was the body's response to it. Um, it, it has, the, there was still some form of volitional will um by the person to do that thing, my opinion, my opinion. Because, again, I really do not believe that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, possesses people. I really do not believe that. I don't think that the mind shuts off and the Holy Spirit uses our body as a puppet. I really don't. Um, here's the reason why. Revelations. In the book of Revelations, Jesus says, um, I will, I will, um, I will knock on the door, I'll seek, and so forth, I forgot. <laughs> but it, he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He will not, he will not forcibly control us. He, there's something about our free will that God desires. And so that's just my opinion. Yes, Ace. Um, I would like to think of it the same way we think of any other bodily reaction, like, um, like maybe getting you know, goosebumps because right. of cold or... Sometimes we shiver because right. you know, like our body just shakes when we when we feel the sure. breeze or something like that. Sure. And so it's beyond our control, but it doesn't mean we're possessed. You know, like we're not intentionally shaking our body. We're not intentionally making bumps grow up on our skin. True. But it's it's a reaction. And so I think that like you you're wording it an overwhelming reaction. Like right. It's it's that times maybe ten. Right. To the point that you know I'm shaking or my lip is quivering right. or you know like. You know what I'm saying? Like no. I can't stand I mean, up straight because right. I feel a weight, and so 
it's to a point that it feels like, you know, I'm out of my control. Like I'm doing things that I I wouldn't prefer that I do right now. Right. But it's a reaction. Right. Like for example, uh, uncontrollable crying. Yeah. Right. No, that's a good point. Like you that's know, a I very don't want to stop crying, but right. I can't because right. of what I'm feeling. Very good. Very it's good. Not saying that I'm possessed by sadness. Right. 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 No. 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 It's a reaction to what's happening. And I think in that context, I think in that context, you're absolutely right. That's what happens to me. I can't control it. Like when I feel, I, I had a teacher of theology one time saying, find out your clue, your body's clue when the Lord's presence is near. Find that out. And she gave a list. And one particular point that resonated with me was, um, was uh, tears. Where this idea that when you enter into this room, you cannot control crime. And I was like, no matter how emotionally you feel, you know, why am I crying? You know? And, and she said, that is a body's clue that the Lord's presence is near. You know? Another one is warmth. Another one is warmth. Another one is the tingling of your fingers. You know? So, again, it's not scientific, but... Figure out, and it will happen over and over again. That's why you'll know. But figure out your body's clue when the Lord's presence is near. Yes, Cynthia. Um, I, I feel like you might have said it, or... I don't I'll take it if it sounds good. <laughs> but I, remember, I remember hearing one time that, like, I don't know, I'm, like, half of my brain's working, and the other half is working. When you are crying or something, or yeah, or some, or there's something that it's, happens it's, physically, yeah, to let you know that you need God spiritually, or something, something like that. That sounds good. I can't. I'm, I'm only half remembering it. I wish I could remember more. Okay, if it, it, comes, it, to you, if it comes with like you, if it comes to you, yeah, I, I think I, I like it. <laughs> but go ahead, Brittany. Um, so what if somebody's just saying, like, haven't I not called you? Da -da 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 and then they just, like, walk like walk away after they, like, rebuke me or something like that. You know, not even saying, like, I feel like the Lord is saying, like, he has called you or da -da -da, but, like, okay. you saying it in first person as if they were God. Ah. Well, it comes from scripture. So there's this safety there that it's not anything new. It, it actually comes from the Lord because we believe what is the Bible. It is God's very word, you right. know. And so um, the, the test, though, is the interpretation of it and how it was used yeah. and how it was used, you know. Because a lot of times false prophets will use the very same resource and abuse it, you know. And so we need to figure out after. And that's why it's okay when a prophecy comes out to test it and initially say, I don't know if that is from the Lord. Let me find out. Go to scripture and so forth. You know, it's okay as Christians to test prophecy. It's fine. God says it three or four times. God says it. Test prophecy. Don't just say, oh, I trust it. I'm supposed to marry this woman or I'm supposed to give millions of dollars to this ministry. I trust it. You know, no. Say, I, I don't know. The spirit within me tells me something else. You know, Cynthia. Um, is it possible? I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but like, is it? Do you think it's like more likely than not? I don't know. Let me just say what I'm saying. That when we are receiving a prophetic word, that as you said, like we constantly interpret it, but maybe it wasn't necessarily the person speaking and giving the prophecy that misinterpreted it. But it was us receiving it. And oh, that happens too. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That happens too. You think that, that happens more often, maybe? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes, Monica. Oh, and I'm under the impression that when somebody prophesies, gives you a word, um, doesn't it have to, like, when they give you something, isn't it to either confirm what you've been praying about okay. or to, like, like, uh, is it something, like, totally random? Like, oh, I, I wasn't even thinking about that. Or would it be something that you've just been dealing Most with? Most times they're not. Most times they're not. If it confirms with something that you're dealing with, it's probably from the Lord. It's probably from the Lord. If it's something random, then you test it. Yeah. 
I was just like, so if, yeah. I'm trying to think of an example of something random. Okay. Like, how do you test? Well, you just got to be honest with yourself and just, and, and, and be in accepting of having some kind of skepticism. You know what I'm saying? Where it's just like, and just feel it, you know? And it takes a while, but like at that moment when someone prophesies over you, go with the gut. It's just like, okay, I, I was struggling with this. I know this. This is something, yeah, it is of the Lord. But it's just like, but in your gut, it says, this is, I have no idea. This is weird. Yeah, well, what are you talking about? I found myself in like a spot like that, but uh, then I'm just like, wait. Right. Like I'm, right. I'm not in that season. Like right. I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah. But then I think, is there something that I'm not that I'm missing here? So like, this is, but this is on? all good. These questions that you ask about prophetic utterances, ask the questions. That's my point. That's my point. You know what I'm saying? Don't just accept them blindly. So ask. Can ask the Lord, like, exactly. 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 Because it could be something for you to be prepared in the future. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, hey, Monica, I know you're not feeling this right now, but watch out. And I'm going to say, you know, God, no, thank you. I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I don't think this is of the Lord. But we we need to constantly ask questions and say, oh, man, maybe I do have to go there. Maybe I do have to stop. Maybe I do have to do this. I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now. You know, so just ask questions. Ask questions. Yes. I guess so. Would that be where discernment comes in? Absolutely. And discernment is more than just simply a spiritual gift because I feel a lot of times when people say, I have the gift of discernment, it's like God's giving nuggets of knowledge to people. Discernment is also done by the own human mind, like Sherlock Holmes kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, that's a gift of discernment. You know, just like just knowing, okay, who, what kind of person this is, what kind of person am I? Why is he saying it? Why is she talking about it? And so forth. That's discernment as well. Okay? All right, let's continue on. There's still a lot more stuff. So shared qualities and traits of all prophets. Every prophet, especially, especially the minor, the ones that we're talking about, they were called. You need to have a call. You need to have a call. Or the minor prophets were all called by God. Okay? You need to have a divine call. Another thing, you must have a divine word. God gave you a word to speak to God's people. And there's not just these two, but a lot of times when we think about prophets, we think about their future tellers. There are more than that, okay? So these prophets are foretellers. They speak of things in the future. That's what a foreteller is, foreteller, okay? That's like 10% of what a prophet does, you guys, especially the Old Testament prophets. Really, it's just 10%. 90% of the time, they are forth tellers. Mm -hmm. They tell you about a current situation. And if you want a definition of a prophet, this is it. Divine interpretation of current events. That is what a prophet, an Old Testament prophet, really is. An Old Testament prophet is a person who has the art, the skill, the divine call to, div to divinely interpret current events. So if we had an Old, prophet, uh, Old Testament prophet in our time today, he would give us the divine message of what's happening in our presidential election. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? He will he will give us he will give us a divine interpretation of what's happening with ISIS. He would give us a divine inter interpretation of what's going on in Europe. Okay? He would give us a divine interpretation of what's happening with with the slave uh, with the slave industry that we still have today. Okay? Which is horrible, absolutely wrong. But that's what a prophet is. One more time, a prophet divinely interprets current events. That is an Old Testament prophet. 
He divinely interprets current events. If it has to do with a future thing, fine. But that's just simply attached to it. His real motif, his real goal is to divinely interpret things that are happening right now. And basically, this is what he's saying. This is what God wants you to do in the presidential race. This is what God wants you to do with ISIS. This is what God wants you to do to destroy sex trafficking. This is God wants you to do to take care of business in America. That's a prophet. That is a prophet. Okay? So, questions about that? Okay. Have you heard of the book Sophia? No, I haven't. It's a, it's a book about um, how to be a prophet yeah. or being a seer. Um, and it talks about some of these things. And questions that okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Another common trait divine visions. They see crazy, crazy things. Yeah. They see crazy things. But add with divine vision, I don't have it in my notes, but add in divine vision, divine imagination. Yeah. Divine imagination. Because a lot, especially the major prophets that we went through, one major prophet took off his clothes, just wore his tidy whities and just <laughs> walked around the marketplace wearing his underwear. You know what I'm saying? And people in their right minds like, what are you doing? But he's saying, look, what I'm doing right now, you guys are going to do in like 30 years when Babylon conquers you. That's divine imagination. Divine imagination. Okay? Um, there's also mighty works. Mighty works. Not a whole lot with the latter prophets, but you see it with Elijah, Elisha, and the former. They're imbued with the divine spirit. They're imbued with the divine spirit. They don't, they don't do anything without God's approval. They do everything with God's approval. Yes? I remember when I first came to SUM, and I was at the altar, and I was, it was like the spiritual emphasis, and I remember like 10 people prophesied. Were they all the same? And, and no, okay. but I just remember like all of the students had a, like, not all of them, but yeah. a lot of people came behind me, and it was like, I, I almost felt like it. it's like, oh, she's at the altar, and she's crying. Perfect time to prophesy mm -hmm. over. And I just remember being like so overwhelmed with like, just like everything, because I, I hadn't, that's never happened to me before until I got here. And then I remember when I started at SUM, like that next, the following trimester, I was like, like a freaking shotgun, like, I gotta, I gotta word for everybody. I, I gotta, yeah. Yeah, I gotta, yeah. I was like, over everybody. And I just remember like being totally undisciplined when it came to just, okay. Like the gifting because I just saw how it was done and I just assumed like everybody has this gift and everybody can prophesy and everybody can run around the right. chapel and right. <laughs> catch somebody when they're right. most vulnerable and just tell them something that's just popping up right. at the top of your head. Right. Um, I guess those seasons are necessary, but I was just thinking like, how the heck did how the heck were they? these prophets like trained up to that's a great question that's a great question that's why a lot of people see there's an allusion to a prophetic school right. and so forth but I want to say this when you when you mention that there's a lot of truth to what you're saying so I embrace it like the very fact that um, I might not be considered a prophet in the eyes of God but in his will God will use me for prophetic utterances you know what I'm saying just like what happened with you you know but I want to say this and you don't have to take notes this is just again a continue of my Simon two cents, if you will. Um, a true prophet understands this truth. The gift and the role of prophet is more of a burden than a privilege. Yeah. The role of a prophet is more of a burden of a pr than a privilege. Okay, it, a true prophet embraces that. A lot of times, especially in America, evangelical churches, they use the prophet motif or they use the prophet um, position only to make them feel special. That sense of privilege. Look at me. I, have, I get special divine revelation from the Lord. I'm a special child of God. If you've taken my Galatians and Romans class, what is that demanding distinction? Unnecessary distinction. 
you've created a class system in God's community where God did not design it as so. Okay? But when you realize truly, when you read the scriptures, how many of the prophets were like the first apostles, they died for their faith. There's this legend of Isaiah being sawed in half. Many of these prophets died for their faith. They knew the burden, but it was so powerful. Just like Jeremiah said, it was like fire within the bones. I couldn't do anything about it. I had to proclaim. So a true prophet knows the burden and still embraces it. That is a true prophet. And in my opinion, I haven't seen one in a while. Okay? Perhaps Mina, perhaps Mina, I would love to I would love to talk to her and um, just get just have a cup of tea with her and stuff. But in America for me, I haven't seen one in a while. So, yes. Then what would you what would you call um, the people who, or I could say us, because I get them too, like, who get words for people mm -hmm. from the Lord. They're not, I, personally, they're not maybe a full prophet. Like I said, they might be used by God to share prophetic utterances. They're, they're, they might not be a full prophet, though. That's just my my opinion, though, you know. So you can disagree with that. Yes, go for it. The, the, the way to word it is to say like there's a class or office of a prophet and then there's being prophetic. Right. And That's so, what I'm trying to say. Like, you know, like I can play sports. I'm athletic, but I'm right. not happy. Right. I'm not like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like there's a, there's a special place or office or right. role that a prophet plays, but there are those who can, um, who can act as one because... Right. You know, the, those gifts aren't just for, he said, you know, I will that all shall prophesy. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. those gifts are for the body. Right. But there's those who play a specific office in a role. Right. You know, we can be apostolic, but there's an apostle. Exactly. And, you know, exactly. Anyone can teach something. But exactly. There are those who are teachers. Right. And so for me, personally, Ebony, the last, in my opinion, that I know popularly who was a Old Testament model of a prophet, he had the role of a prophet, was Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. I believe without a shadow of a doubt, even in the midst of his imperfections, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God called him to be an Old Testament-like prophet for America. That's just my thing. Okay? All right, cool. So there's mighty works. There's also a divine spirit. But check this out, you guys. All of them were people of prayer. All of them were people of prayer. They weren't reactive. These people were not reactive. They were strategic. They prepared, and they prepared in the closet. They, repaired, they prepared in the prayer room. Okay? These people, these people weren't all about action, even though we like their actions. All of that action was strategically prepared in prayer. Okay? Yes? Sorry. So does a prophet need to be, like, because you were saying how you've never, you haven't seen a prophet. Does a prophet need to be a prophet to a nation? Or, like, can it, can the prophet... It could be a prophet to a com church community. It could be a prophet to a region. It could be a prophet, he could be a prophet to the nation. Yeah, he could be a prophet to the world. I don't know if that will go that far. <laughs> But yeah, it could it could be it could be very micro and it could be very global. So, okay, sir. Um, when you say that a, uh, I guess a, a prophet that is called pretty much um, of God, if you will, like being like an old mate, old major prophet, I guess, is someone that's um, bold and that proclaims a word despite it being totally different from like circumstance but yet at the same time being able to back it up with scripture but yet just sure. being bold with it you know a lot of times boldness is not the necessary component for a prophet it would help oh it would sure help but a lot of times boldness was not the necessary component for example jeremiah he was freaking out i was like no i don't want this i don't want this and for some reason God convinced him in a way, or it was by God's presence that compelled him to do it, you know? And just like, basically, you're willing to give up your identity to do this thing. That's what a prophet is. You're, and it's, 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 it's like the Marines. 
if you see if you see God's kingdom as a military unit, the prophet is the marine. They go in first, and they're the last one to come back. You know what I'm saying? They have the worst job ever, in my opinion, especially in Old Testament times. They usually tell the bad news. They get hurt because of it, and still God says, you got to keep on doing it. You know? So, so boldness helps, but it's not always the key component. So, may I continue on? Yeah. One last slide. I don't think we'll have time to talk about the minor prophets, but this is all good discussion because this is something this is something I want every student in the class to consider. First of all, there's a difference between Old Testament prophets and Christian prophets. I want you guys to understand that there is a difference between Old Testament prophets and Christian prophets. I want that discussion to continue on. I want us to find out the differences between an Old Testament prophet and a Christian prophet. I also want us to find out, do Old Testament prophets exist today? Do Old Testament prophets exist today? I see, I see you nodding your head. And, okay, that's great. Let's talk about that. Why? Why are there no Old Testament prophets? Is it because God ordained it so? Or is it because perhaps the church is too chicken to, to have Old Testament prophets nowadays. You know what I'm saying? I know that I don't want this discussion to just stop right here. I want you to continue investigating this as we continue on. But Ebony, go ahead. I'm sorry, you probably already said this, but the difference between an Old Testament Not yet. I haven't talked about it yet. Oh. Yeah, but we'll talk about it during class because I do want to bring that up. I do want to bring that up. Because there is there is a difference. There is a difference, especially the response and the outcome yeah. of the message between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet. But let me continue on. Common themes of prophets. Common themes of prophets, especially these minor prophets. They demanded covenant obligation. Return to your responsibility. Stop slacking. Return to your responsibility. Read your textbooks. Do your homework. Return to your obligations. Okay? Do your do your Christian service hours. Clean up. <laughs> Remember your covenant obligations. <laughs> what does that mean? <clears throat> covenant obligation. A return a call to return to God and His Word. A call to return to God and His Word. Because in the mindset of the Old Testament prophet, God's word was ethical. The teaching of God was relational, how you treat one another. And when the prophet saw that the poor man was, the, the, the rich man was getting richer and fatter and the poor man was dying, he saw in his eyes, in tear-stained eyes, this is not God's society. This cannot be God's society. Something needs to change, okay? It's a call back to return to God's word. It is a call to personal holiness and righteousness. A call to personal holiness and righteousness. And again, please understand righteousness, especially in a very mor moral sense, relationally. Righteousness does not mean that you look you, you, you comb your hair a certain way, you wear the button-down shirt, you wear the pleated khakis. It doesn't mean that. You don't watch Batman and Superman. You don't listen to secular music. You don't drink. It doesn't mean that. Righteousness, especially in the context of Old Testament, means how you treat one another. How you treat one another. If you bite back people, if you gossip towards people, if you hurt people because you enjoy hurting them, you are not of God. We are not of God if we do that, okay? That's what righteousness is, all right? If you are reactive, if you get angry quickly towards your brother and sister, you are not of God. We are not of God. I am not of God. Righteousness is always relational. Righteousness is always ethical. Righteousness is Morality, okay? Morality. And then another thing about covenant obligation, it is a call for God's people to be at peace with each other. 
has to do with relationship. What does that mean? Shalom. We are at shalom with one another. We are at peace with one another. That's a good word. So if I'm a rich man in Israel and I'm continually accumulating wealth and I'm neglecting the widow, is that shalom? Oh. Exactly. 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 You know? And it should be, it should come from the abundance of my heart. It should come from this idea that God sees me just as much as God sees the widow. And if God has blessed me with this great accumulation of wealth, what should I do? I feed the widow. That is what shalom is. Yes. Mm -hmm. and to take care of that person mm -hmm. and um and the emotional side of it is is extra yes yes and um i sometimes like when i hear stuff about like love or whatever especially in context of like scripture i think of it in those terms mm -hmm. and um i thought of it too when aaron was speaking this morning for Jesus, and he was saying like to love um you know to love god and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself and I was just thinking, like, in a situation, like, just like you had described, like, it's not even just to be at peace with one another, but it's, like, in taking care of that widow, it's my showing that I love them. Yep. You know, like, in providing for them and in giving to them and taking yeah. care of them. Yeah, definitely. Amen. All right. Uh, another common theme of the prophets, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Okay. The day of the Lord, in its essence, is eschatological. The essence of this idea of the day of the Lord is eschatological, meaning at the end of it all, at the end of it all, God's going to bring justice, God's going to redeem, so forth and whatnot, okay? There was two ways to see the day of the Lord, two ways. One was a pro-Israel way, meaning this. Israel had enemies. God is going to kill those enemies off. And God is going to establish the eternal Davidic king on the throne. And we're going to be living happily ever after in our fantasy castles. Okay? That's the pro-Israel version. All right? Here's what the prophets brought up. And this was very revolutionary during the time of the prophets. It was to punish Israel. The day of the Lord is a time to punish Israel. Is that a contradiction? No. Because there is a day of the Lord where Israel will be saved. We haven't experienced that yet. But there was constant day of the Lord where God's people have been punished. Or disciplined, if you will. Okay? So this is the, the punishing Israel is the perspective that the prophets bring up. The day of the Lord will come where God is going to purge his people. And in the Christian vernacular, in the Christian language, what that means is God is going to discipline his people. Okay? So here's another question to consider when we read the Minor Prophets. Will God discipline the church? Are we experiencing that discipline now? Who knows? Okay? All right. And then finally, finally one last theme, that uh, one last common theme of the prophets is Mashiach. Messiah. Messiah. Okay? Messiah is another common theme. Okay? Um, now, what does Messiah mean if you take in my class? Guy. Greasy guy. He's exactly. He is the anointed one, but anoint it's just a fancy word to be to be bathed in grease or oil. Exactly. But he is a chosen vessel, or she's a chosen vessel, to accomplish what God wants to do. Hopefully it was coconut oil, because I hear that's really good for the skin. It's actually, it was olive. <laughs> I got you. But the nerd in me will always... The nerd in me will always rebuttal and try to correct. Anyways... Any questions or comments? What about that grease? About that oil? 
<laughs> I didn't know there was gonna ever be a, a mess. When did they know there was gonna be a messiah? Like after the the fall of the Jerusalem, or was it yeah. always a part of the plan that there was gonna be a messiah after Adam and Eve? And they just knew that there was um. According to a lot of historical interpretations of rabbis, it was from the very beginning. Mm. Okay. Because there's something known as the Proto-Evangelium in um, Genesis 3. But anyway, um, besides the point, so um, was that your, was your hand up? 